This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. War. Do you realize what it means? Do you know of any more terrible word in our language? Does it not bring to your mind pictures of slaughter and carnage? Of murder, pillage, and destruction? Can't you hear the belching of the cannon? The cries of the dying and the wounded? Can you not see the battlefield strewn with corpses? Living humans torn to pieces, their blood and brains scattered about? Men full of life suddenly turned into carrion? And there at home, thousands of fathers and mothers, wives and sweethearts, living in hourly dread lest some mischance befell their loved ones, and waiting, waiting for the return of those who will return nevermore. You know what war means, even if yourself have never been at the front. You know there is no greater curse than war with its millions of dead and maimed, its countless human sacrifices, its broken lives, ruined homes, its indescribable heartache and misery. It's terrible, you admit, but it can't be helped. You think that war must be, that times come when it is inevitable, that you must defend your country when it is in danger. Let us see, then, whether you really defend your country when you go to war. Let us see what causes war, and whether it is for the benefit of your country that you are called upon to don the uniform and start off on the campaign of slaughter. Let us consider whom and what you defend in war, who is interested in it, and who profits by it. We must return to our manufacturer, unable to sell his product in his own country. He, and manufacturers of other commodities likewise, seeks a market in some foreign land. He goes to England, Germany, France, or to some other country and tries to dispose of his overproduction production of his surplus. But there he finds the same conditions as in his own country. There they also have overproduction. That is, the workers have been so exploited and underpaid that they cannot afford to buy the commodities they have produced. The manufacturers of England, Germany, France, etc. are therefore looking for other markets, just as the American manufacturer. The American manufacturers of a certain industry organize themselves into a big combine. The industrial magnates of the other countries do the same, and national combines begin competing with each other. The capitalists of each country try to grab the best markets, especially the new markets. They find such new markets in India, China, Japan, and similar countries. That is, in countries that have not yet developed their own industries. When each country will have developed its own industries, there will, no, there will be no more foreign markets. And then some powerful capitalist group will become the international trust of the whole world. But in the meantime, the capitalistic interests of the various industrial countries fight for the foreign markets and compete with each other there. They compel some weaker nation to give them special privileges, favored treatment, and they arouse the envy of their competitors and get into trouble about concessions and sources of profit and call upon their respective governments to defend their interests. The American capitalist appeals to the government to protect his American interests. The capitalists of France, Germany, and England do the same. They call upon their governments to protect their profits. Then the various governments call upon the people to defend their country. Do you see how the game is played? You are not told that you are asked to protect the privileges and dividends of some American capitalist in a foreign country. They know that if they tell you that, you would laugh at them, and you would refuse to go and get yourself shot to swell the profits of plutocrats. But without you and others like you, they can't make war. So they raise the cry of, defend your country, your flag is insulted. Sometimes they actually hire thugs to insult your country's flag in a foreign land, or get some American property destroyed there so as to try to make sure the people at home will get wild over it and rush to join the army or navy. Don't think I exaggerate. 
American capitalists are known to have caused even revolutions in foreign countries, particularly in South America, so as to get a more friendly new government there and thus secure the concessions they wanted. But generally, they don't need to go to such lengths. All they have to do is appeal to your word patriotism, flatter you a bit, and tell you that you can lick the whole world. And then they get you ready to don the soldier's uniform and do their bidding. This is what your patriotism, your love of country, is used for. Truly did the great English thinker Carlyle write, What, quite speaking, in an unofficial language, is the net purport an upshot of war. To my own knowledge, for example, there dwell and toil in the British village of Dumdrudge, usually some five hundred souls. From these, by certain natural enemies of the French, there are successfully selected, during the French war, say thirty able-bodied men. Dumdrudge, at her own expense, has suckled and nursed them, she has not, without difficulty and sorrow, fed them up to manhood, and even trained them to crafts, so that one can weave, and the other build, another hammer, and the weakest can stand under thirty stone. Nevertheless, amid much weeping and swearing, they are selected, all dressed in red, and shipped away at public charge some two thousand miles, or say, only to the south of Spain, and there fed till wanted. And now, at that same spot in the south of Spain, there are thirty similar French artisans, from a French dumdrudge, in a like manner wending, till at length, after infinite effort, the two parties come into actual ju juxtaposition, and the thirty stands fronting thirty, each with a gun in his hand. Straight away the word fire is given, and they blow the souls out of one another. And in the place of sixty brusque, useful craftsmen, the world has sixty dead carcasses, which it must bury and anon shed tears for. Had these men any quarrel? Busy as the devil is, not the smallest. They lived far apart. They were strangers, the entiredest of strangers. Nay, in so wide a universe, there was not even unconsciously by commerce some mutual helplessness between them. How then, simpleton, their governors had fallen out, and instead of shooting one another, had the cunning to make these poor blockheads shoot. It is not for your country that you fight when you go to war. It is for your governors, your rulers, your capitalistic masters. Neither your country, nor humanity, neither your class, the workers, gain anything by war. It is only the big financiers and the capitalists who profit by it. War is bad for you. It is bad for the workers. They have everything to lose and nothing to gain by it. They don't even get any glory for it. For the, that goes the big generals and the field marshals. What do you get in war? You get lousy. You get shot, gassed, maimed, or killed. That is all the workers of any country get out of war. War is bad for your country, bad for humanity. It spells slaughter and destruction. Everything that war destroys, bridges and harbors, cities and ships, fields and factories, all must be built up again. That means that the people are taxed, directly and indirectly, to build it up. For in the last analysis, everything comes from the pockets of the people. So war is bad for them materially, not to speak of the brutalizing effect wars had upon mankind in general. And don't forget that 999 out of every thousand workers who are killed, blinded, or maimed in war are of the laboring class, sons of workers and farmers. In modern war, there is no victor, for the winning side loses as almost as much as the defeated one, sometimes even more, like France in the late struggle. France is poorer today than Germany. The workers of both countries are taxed to starvation to make good the losses sustained by war. Labor's wages and standards of living are much lower now in the European countries that participated in the World War than they were before the Great Catastrophe. But the United States got rich through the war, you object. 
You mean a handful of men gained millions, and that the big capitalists made huge profits? Surely they did. The great financiers, by lending Europe money at a high rate of interest and by supplying war material and, and munitions. But where did you come in? Just stop and consider how Europe is paying off its financial debt to America, or the interest on it. It does so by squeezing more labor and profits out of the workers, by paying lower wages and producing goods more cheaply than the European manufacturers can undersell their American competitors. And for this reason, the American manufacturer is compelled to also produce at lower cost. That's where his economy and rationalization come in. And as a result, you must work harder or have your wages re reduced or be thrown out of employment altogether. Do you see how low wages in Europe directly affect your own condition? Do you realize that you, the American worker, are helping pay the American bankers the interest on their European loans? There are people who claim that war is good because it cultivates physical courage. The argument is stupid. It is only made by those who have themselves never been to war and whose fighting is done by others. It is a dishonest argument to induce poor fools to fight for the interests of the rich. People who have actually fought in battles will tell you that modern war has nothing to do with personal courage. It is a mass of fighting at a great distance from the enemy. Personal encounters in which the best man may win are extremely rare. In modern war, you don't get to see your antagonists. You fight blindly, like a machine. You go into battle scared to death, fearing that the next minute you may be shot to pieces. You go only because you don't have the courage to refuse. The man who can face vilification and disgrace, who can stand up against the popular current, even against his friends and his country when he knows he is right, who can defy those in authority over him, who can take punishment and prison and remain steadfast, that man of, that is a man of courage, the fellow who you taunt as a slacker, because he refuses to turn murderer. He needs courage. But do you need much courage just to obey orders as you are told to fall in and in line with thousands of others to the tune and general approval of the star-spangled banner? War paralyzes your courage and deadens the spirit of true manhood. It degrades and stupefies with a sense that you are not responsible Tis not yours to reason why, but to do and die, like the hundred thousand others doomed like yourself. War means blind obedience, unthinking stupidity, brutish callousness, wanton destruction, and irresponsible murder. I have met persons who say that war is good because it kills many people, so that there is more work for the survivors. Consider what a terrible indictment this is against the present system. Imagine what a condition of things where it is good for the people of a certain community to have a, some number of them killed off so that the rest can live better. Would it not be the worst man-eating system, the worst cannibalism? That is just what capitalism is. A system of cannibalism which devours his fellow man or is devoured by him. This is true of capitalism in times of peace, as in war, except that in war its real character is unmasked and more evident. In a sensible, humane society, that could not be. On the contrary, the greater the population of a certain community, the better it would be for all, because the work of each would be then lighter. A community is no different in this regard from a fam family. Every family needs a certain amount of work to be done in order to keep its wants supplied. Now the more persons there are in a family to do the necessary work, the easier for each member, the less work for each. The same holds true of a community or of a country, which is only a family on a large scale. The more people there are to do the work necessary to supply the needs of the community, the easier the task of each member. 
If the contrary is the case in our present-day society, then it merely goes to prove that conditions are wrong, barbaric, and perverse. Nay, more, that they are absolutely criminal if the capitalist system can survive off the slaughter of its members. It is evident, then, that for the workers, war means only greater burdens, more taxes, harder toil, and the reduction of their pre-war standard of living. But there is one element in a capitalist society for whom war is good. It is the element that coins money out of war, that gets rich on your patriotism and self-sacrifice. It is the munitions manufacturers, the speculators in food and other supplies, the warship builders, in short, the great lords of finance, industry, and commerce who alone benefit by war. For these, war is a blessing. A blessing in more than one way. Because war also serves to distract attention of the laboring masses from their every, everyday misery and turns it into high politics and human slaughter. Governments and rulers have often sought to avoid popular uprising and revolution by staging a war. History is full of such examples. Of, co of course, war is a double-edged sword. Often, in turn, it leads to revolt. But that is another story to which we shall return when we come to the Russian Revolution. If you, had f if you have followed me thus far, you must realize that war is just as much a direct result and inevitable effect of the capitalist system as are the regular financial and industrial crises. When a crisis comes, in the manner of which I described it, with its unemployment and hardships, when you are told that it is no one's fault, that it is bad times, the result of overproduction and similar humbug, and when capitalist competition for profits brings about a condition f of war, the capitalists and their flunkies, the politicians and the press, raise the cry, save your country, in order to fill it with false patriotism and make you fight their battles for them. In the name of patriotism, you are ordered to stop being decent and honest, to cease being yourself, to, sus to suspend your own judgment, and to give up your life, to become a willless cog in a murderous machine, blindly obeying the order to kill, pillage, and destroy, to give up your mother and father, wife and child, and all that you love, and proceed to slaughter your fellow men who never did you any harm, who are just as unfortunate and deluded victims of their masters as you are of yours. Only too, only too truly did Carlyle say that patriotism is the refuge of scoundrels. Can't you see how you are fooled and duped? Take the war, for example. Consider how the people of America were tricked into participation. They did not want to mix in European affairs. They knew little of them. They did not care to be dragged into the murderous brawls. They elected Woodrow Wilson on a he kept us out of war slogan. But the American plutocracy saw that huge fortunes could be gained in the war. They were not satisfied with the millions they were reaping by selling ammunition and other supplies to European combatants. Immeasurably greater profits were to be made by getting a big country like the United States, with, it, with its over 100 millions of population, into the fray. President Wilson could not withstand the pressure. After all, government is the maidservant of fi the financial powers. It is here to do their bidding. But how did America get into the war when her people were so expressly against it? Didn't they elect Woodrow Wilson on the president on the clear promise to keep the country out of war? In former days, under absolute monarchs, the subjects were simply compelled to obey the king's command. But that often involved resistance and danger of rebellion. In modern times, there are surer and safer means of making the people serve the interests of their rulers. All that is necessary is to talk them into believing that they themselves want what their masters want them to do, that it is in their own interests, good for their country, good for humanity. In this manner, the noble and fine in instincts of man are harnessed to do the dirty work of the capitalistic class, to the shame and injury of mankind. 
Modern inventions help this game and make it comparatively easy. The printed word, the telegraph, the telephone, and the radio are all sure aids in this manner. The genius of man, having produced these wonderful things, is exploited and degraded in the interests of Mammon and Mars. President Wilson introduced a new device to snare the American people into the war for the benefit of big business. Woodrow Wilson, the former college president, discovered a war for democracy, a war to end war. With that hypocritical motto, a countrywide campaign was started, rousing the worst tendencies of intolerance, persecution, and murder in American hearts, filling them with venom and hatred against everyone who had had the courage to voice an honest and independent opinion, beating up, imprisoning, and deporting those who had dared to say that it was a capitalistic war for profits, conscientious objectors to taking of human life or brutally maltreated as slackers and condemned to long penitentiary terms, men and women who reminded their Christian countrymen of the Nazarene's command, thou shalt not kill, were branded cowards and shut up in prison, radicals who declared the war was only in the interests of capitalism were treated as vicious foreigners and enemy spies. Special laws were rushed through to stifle every free expression of opinion. Dire punishment was meted out on every objector, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Hundred percenters, drunk with the murderous patriotism, spread terror. The whole country went mad with a frenzy of jingoism. The nationwide militarist propaganda at last swept the American people into the field of carnage. Wilson was too proud to fight, but not too proud to send others to do the fighting for his financial backers. He was too proud to, too proud to fight, but not too proud to help the American plutocracy coin gold out of the lives of 70,000 Americans left dead on European battlefields. The war for democracy, the war to end war, proved the greatest sham in history. As a matter of fact, it started a chain of new wars not yet ended. It has since been admitted, even by Wilson himself, that the war served no purpose except to reap vast profits for big business. It created more complications in European affairs than had ever existed before. It pauperized Germany and France and brought them to the brink of national bankruptcy. It loaded the peoples of Europe with stupendous debts and put unbearable burdens upon the working class. The resources of every country were strained. The progress of science was registered by new facilities of destruction. Christian precept was proven the multiplication of murder and treaties were signed with human blood. The World War built huge fortunes for the lords of finance and tombs for the workers. And today? Today we stand again on a new brink of war, far greater and more terrible than the last Holocaust. Every government is preparing for it and appropriating millions of dollars of workers' sweat and blood for the coming carnage. Think it over, my friend and see what capital and go government are doing for you. Doing to you. Soon they will be calling upon you to defend your country. In times of peace, you are a slave in a field and factory. In war, you serve as cannon fodder, all the greater glory for your masters. Yet you are told that everything is all right, that it is God's will, that it must be so. Don't you see that it is not God's will at all, but the doings of capital and government? Can't you see that it is so and must be so only because you permit your political and industrial masters to fool and dupe you so that they can live in comfort and luxury off your toil and tears while they treat you as common people and lower orders just good enough to slay for them? It has always been so, you remark meekly. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. 
You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.